So um, my name's Gary Stevenson. Uh, I'm talking to you from East London, uh, close to Canary Wharf. Uh, I come from East London, a place called Ilford. Um, I grew up in quite a poor family, basically, and I, it wasn't a political family. I wasn't a political person as a child. Uh, my main aim as a kid was to just get a good job and, and try and make some money and try and not be poor anymore, basically. Um, I was pretty good at maths as a kid, um, and I managed to get into the London School of Economics, which is a quite a fancy economics university here in London. Um, when I was there, that was uh, 2005 to 2008 I was there, everybody was sort of going mad to get into investment banking. Um, I didn't really know what investment banking was, but, but the big job everybody wanted to do at the time was to be a trader. So I decided, well, I'll try and do that then, if that's what we're all doing. Um, and I found out that Citibank hired one trader year through a, through a competition, which is basically a card game. So in 2006, I entered this card game competition, uh, which was basically a maths game, really. Um, and I won that competition. And as a result of that, I got a job as an interest rates trader for Citibank. Um, so I did an internship in 2007, and then I started working full time in 2008. So 2008, obviously, was the year of the financial crisis. So um, I started working in June 2008, a few months before that really all kicked off. Um, then, obviously, the global economy blew up. Lehman went under. Um, my job at the time was basically to bet on interest rates. Um, and in 2008, pretty much every interest rate in the world went to zero. So the job that I and my colleagues were doing then was basically to try and work out when will interest rates recover, which is kind of a proxy in a way for when will the economy recover. Um, and the history of it is super interesting, actually, because in 2008, everybody predicted that rates would come up in 2009, and we know now they didn't. In 2009, everybody said they'd go up in 2010. Again, they didn't. In 2010, everybody said 2011. In 2011, everybody said 2012. That continued every single year until 2020, when with the COVID crisis, everybody agreed that interest rates would never go up again. And then obviously a couple of years later, that they uh, increased very quickly. So it's safe to say that we're very bad at predicting interest rates, which is, which is worrying really, because interest rates are a pretty big barometer of what's happening in the whole economy. Um, and my, when I was there sort of observing this, um, I was very struck by it, right? Because I studied economics at the London School of Economics, which is a very prestigious university. Then I went to work with these very well-paid economists, essentially, and every single year they were wrong in their predictions of the economy. Um, and this sort of, to be completely honest, you know, I had pound signs in my eyes, really. I was thinking, well, if these guys are wrong every single year and I can be right, then I can make a ton of money, really. So I, I became obsessed, basically, with trying to understand why it was that the economic recovery after 2008 was so weak. Um, and the theory behind it is that when the Bank of England cuts interest rates very aggressively, you know, they cut it all the way from five and a half down to effectively zero, that's supposed to get people spending, it's supposed to get people like you spending, it's supposed to get businesses investing. And yet by the beginning of 2011, that hadn't happened. People hadn't increased their spending at all. Um, and I wanted to know why, basically. So I decided to to start asking people, you know, why are you not spending more money? Um, and I think I, I was a slightly advantaged by the fact that I come from a poor background. Nowadays, most people working in investment banks come from pretty rich, pretty wealthy backgrounds, to be honest. So I think they're a little bit out of touch with what's really happening, but I came from an ordinary background, so I could just go and ask people, why, why are you not spending money? And um, I probably don't need to tell you what people said. You know, when I asked people, why don't you spend more money? Everybody said the same thing, which is, we don't spend any money because we don't have any more money. As simple as that, basically. Um, and, you know, I didn't take the word for it. I, I started to look into the financial situation of my friends, their families, my family. And, you know, what I saw everywhere I looked was younger people, my generation, you know, I was in my mid-20s at that time, who didn't own houses and would never own houses, and parents who, who owned houses. So, so what we have is basically families losing their wealth over time. And then when I saw that, I thought, well, it doesn't really make any sense to ask why these guys are not spending any more money because they're already spending their wealth away, basically. Then the beginning of 2011, I was in a meeting with one of Citibank's top economists. 
And he asked us to look at the financial situation of Spain, Italy, Portugal, Greece, but also the United Kingdom, the United States, Japan. And in every case, he said, we have governments that are spending much more than their income, that are selling away their assets, that are going further and further into debt. And I couldn't help but notice the similarity between the, the governments of the world, the world's biggest governments, and my friends and their families, right? In both cases, they're spending more than their income over time, they're losing their wealth, they're going into debt. And I just I started thinking, well, if the government's losing their assets and going into debt, and if the ordinary people are losing their assets and going into debt, you know, wh where are all the assets? <laughs> you know, wh where are they going? You know, they're not disappearing. And um, that was basically when the penny dropped for me, that what we actually were looking at after 2008 was a structural crisis of wealth inequality, where ordinary families and also governments were effectively having their wealth sucked away by this small, very wealthy class who were getting richer and richer at a very rapid pace. Um, and it occurred to me that that wasn't going to fix itself, right? These guys would get richer and richer and, and the problem would compound, right? Because once you've lost your assets, then it's even harder to, to accumulate money, right? So that's when I realized that we weren't looking at a temporary crisis, but actually a permanent crisis that would get worse and worse. So uh, I went back to my desk and uh, I put a bet on that the economy would never recover. And by the end of that year, 2011, when I was 24, I became Citibank's most profitable trader in the world on the back of this like phenomenally pessimistic prediction, basically. And um, obviously, that was a very sort of strange space emotionally because it was obviously very gratifying to sort of be right about this thing that everybody was wrong about and to sort of feel that my understanding was correct and was better than the, you know, the prestigious and wealthy people around me. Um, but, you know, obviously the the implications of this prediction are phenomenally bleak for ordinary people and for the country and for the world, right? So I sort of had to spend a bit of time sort of wrestling with my, with my conscience and with my intellect a bit, like, you know, do I really believe this? Is this really going to happen? Um, what does it mean if that happens? What should I do? You know, it's, sort, it's one thing to sort of see the world's going to get worse and worse, but, you know, how do you do anything to stop it? It's not easy, right? So, um, you know, I sat there for another year making the same bet that things would never get better and it was, it was right again and I made, I made a ton of money. Um, and sort of by the end of that year, I just thought, well, I don't think I can do this anymore. It's, it's sort of, it's, I was accumulating all of this money, but to what end, right? Because that money would go to my kids and my kids would live in a world that would be the way I saw it, terrible, you know, phenomenally unequal, phenomenally low living standards. Um, so I walked into my boss's office and I told him um, that, I wanted, that I wanted to quit. And um, that started a bit of a tussle, let's say, between me and some of the Citibank senior management. But uh, it took a while, but I was eventually able to leave. Uh, so I finally quit Citibank in 2014. I was living and working in Tokyo by then. I came back to London, where I live now, um, and basically started thinking, OK, well, is it possible to do anything about this to, to stop this because it's not easy um and the first thing I did was I volunteered at a progressive think tank here in London called New Economics Foundation some of you might have heard of it uh, I wrote a website called wealtheconomics.org which is still up which basically explains how wealth inequality affects the economy what it does to wages what it does to house prices I'm very interested in unaffordability of housing and falling living standards and falling wages I wrote that website and then I realized okay well no one's ever going to read this website because no one knows who I am. Uh, so I decided to go back to university to try and convince the academics. And uh, I got into Oxford to do a two-year master's uh, in economics. And, uh, you know, I don't know if any of you have been to Oxford, no one has been to Oxford, but um, it's probably not the, the most representative place in terms of wealth and class. And uh, I was uh, in a lot of uh, lectures in castles being taught by wealthy people in capes, uh, trying to get them to be interested in falling living standards and growing inequality. And um, we can talk more about it, but suffice to say, they weren't particularly interested. So I decided that um, I had to sort of try and go it alone and um, just try and communicate directly to the people. Um, I finished in Oxford 2019 and very quickly we were in COVID. And, you know, I look at the distribution and at the very beginning of COVID, 
for anyone who was willing to look at it, it was very obvious it was going to cause an enormous increase in inequality. Um, if you want to understand exactly how, we can talk about it, but probably the easiest way is to, to watch the video on my YouTube called How the Rich Get Rich from COVID-19. Uh, there's also an article for Open Democracy called Following the Money Trail, which just explains very quickly, very easily, how COVID would cause an enormous increase in inequality. Um, we can get into it if you want. But um, essentially, I knew the government would give an enormous amount of money out. And the government has given out since COVID £600 billion. Um, you know, these big numbers, I think it's sometimes easy for them to all blow into one. Right? £600 billion would be £12,000 for every single adult in the entire country. That's the amount of money the government has given out since the beginning of COVID. And uh, I wanted to know right from the start who's going to end up with that money. And, you know, I followed it through the system and I worked out very quickly this money is going to end up with the rich. And, you know, I think it's worth sitting and just thinking through, imagining what, what would happen if the government printed £600 billion, which would be £12,000 for every adult in the country, and gave it all to the rich. And I, my predictions were it would cause a massive increase in inequality, a massive increase in inflation, a massive increase in house prices, and a massive decrease in living standards and the cost of living crisis. And I, I wrote a load of articles and, and made some videos in 2020 saying this would happen. Uh, obviously, now it has happened. And uh, basically, I've been screaming about it ever since to anyone who will listen, trying to convince people that, you know, if we allow these massive increases in inequality, ordinary people's living standards will fall trying to find ways to sort of communicate those ideas to people simply. Um, really, at the moment, the YouTube is the heart of it. Um, uh, you know, I don't know if any of you have seen it, but I would love if you go have a look. It's called Gary's Economics. The idea behind the YouTube really is to, is to explain these economic ideas in a way that is super simple, easy to understand, accessible, welcoming for ordinary people, because I think there's a massive gap when it comes to that for economics. I feel like economics explainers on the news are not accessible, are not understandable. Often, to be honest, as, as an economist, I think they're close to nonsense a lot of the time. So I'm trying to create a space really where we can really explain to people, just get people electrified about this idea. Look, if we don't fix inequality, it gets worse. But if we do fix inequality, it can get much better. Um, and yeah, as Laurie kindly said, we're having a lot of success. The YouTube's grown more and more. There was a, you know, I guess some of you guys probably know Enough is Enough, this campaign group. They had a rally up in Newcastle the other day and um, joe.co.uk, some reporters went up and interviewed someone and he was, they interviewed a guy at Geordie in Newcastle and he was going on and on about, you know, the rich are getting richer, we need to do something about it. And then suddenly he said, you yeah, know, have you seen Gary's economics, Gary Stevens on YouTube, go check it out. And I think really like, this is exactly what we're trying to achieve here. We want to communicate to ordinary people what's happening. Let them know that we're not all in it together here. While ordinary people are struggling, the rich have never gotten richer as fast as they have in the last two, three years. You know, we saw the average billionaire increase their wealth by over 200 million pounds in the first year of COVID. You know, the rich are making an absolute fortune here. And yet we're allowing ordinary people to go cold in their homes and, and to not pay for food. And I think if, um, if people knew just how much money the rich were making off of this, they wouldn't accept it. And um, but unfortunately, that hasn't really gotten a space in the debate. So I'm trying to sort of break open that space, make people aware that the rich are making a fortune and that if we don't do anything about it, things will get worse. But if we do, things will get better. Um, so yeah, check my YouTube out and um, I think we'll open up for questions, shall we?